by some 221 health workers to pause the compilation or they will have posterity judge them for the loss of lives. Is the EC going to comply or are they still going to go ahead with the compilation of the voters register? We'll be speaking to some reps um, from the 221 doctors. Remember earlier, uh, it was on the 24th of June, there was an open letter that was addressed to the EC and the topic read mass uh, voters registration will result in mass death. This was signed by 113 health workers and now we have another one from 221. The Ghana Medical Association had also, um, you know, mentioned that if the numbers increase, then we're going to hold the EC accountable. So left, right, center, there have been some caution thrown in, but again, is the EC going to comply at all? We'll ask those questions and many more right here on COVID-19 360. You're welcome. My name is Berla Mundi. And my name is Anita Ikuya Akufu. And over the weekend, we've added some more numbers when it comes to our case count. And as of this morning, we are over 20,000, and that is 20,085 confirmed cases right here in Ghana. And when we look at the global picture as well, we've recorded over 11 million confirmed cases. With India taking over Russia over the past couple of weeks, Russia has been the third highest globally. But now India has taken that huge jump with the United Kingdom going down further, meaning less cases are being recorded in the United Kingdom with countries like Peru and Chile taking over the fifth and sixth position. And so when we get into the figures, I'll be giving you a breakdown of the numbers they are recording in the various countries and also what is uh, recovery is looking like globally. And so this is COVID-19 360. Get interactive with us on our social media pages. A lot of issues are going on yeah. uh, right here in Ghana and also globally. And so we want to have your view and your take on those issues. So Facebook, Instagram and Twitter, it is TV3 Ghana. Our WhatsApp number is active as well. Do get in touch, Bella. Now, uh, a, a little away from the health workers also admonishing the EC to pause the voters register. Let's give you some statistics. Now, on the 18th of June, uh, there was a report that indicated that 97 health workers had tested positive for COVID-19 in the Ashanti region. And now we're hearing from the Ghana Medical Association as well that 150 medical uh, practitioners have also tested positive for COVID-19, out of which four have unfortunately lost their lives. Now, also, let's talk about education. Now, we have confirmed reports that six students from the Accra Girls Senior High School have also tested positive for COVID-19. And I received an SOS message from one of the students, and she was very concerned about what was happening. Now, this is what she wrote. Hello, Miss Mundi. I'm a student of Accra Girls Senior High School, and social distancing is not taken seriously. Our dormitories are choked. It's very bad, and we're really suffocating in the dorm. Please try and come to our aid. And this is a message. Unfortunately, I cannot put out her details just so we can protect her as well. But she's not the only one. There are a lot of them who are actually reaching out to us and telling us what they are going through. I'll also read a story from a doctor, uh, I think a health professional who reached out yesterday, also telling me exactly what they are going through um, in one of the hospitals as well. And so I'll pull it up shortly. Uh, so I tell you what exactly she said. I'll cross over to Anita, or maybe we should do news um, updates now. When we come back, I'll read uh, this conversation with this other health professional in one of our health institutions who's also complaining bitterly. So take a look at this. Oh. Okay. After the easing of restrictive measures and even the reopening of schools, authorities have again decided to restrict movement in the Malagasy capital due to the spike in coronavirus cases. The measures is expected to continue until July 20. The conditions are strict. Only one person per household has the right to go out on the street from 6 a.m. to noon. Until now, the measure extended until 5 p.m. Accustomed to registering dozens of cases of coronavirus per day, the Malagasy Health Authority has reported thousands of cases daily for the past three days, including 216 on Saturday, a record for the country. A total of 1,621 people are currently living with the virus on the island, with 31 serious cases among 23,000 people tested since the beginning of the pandemic. The border between Australia's two most popular states, Victoria and New South Wales, is to close after a spike in COVID-19 cases in Melbourne. The outbreak in Victoria's capital has seen hundreds of cases in the past two weeks, more than 95% of new Australian infections. 
Until now, the two states had maintained open borders even when others had shut them. The closure beginning on Tuesday will restrict travel to permit holders. Victoria's Premier Daniel Andrews said it was in joint decision with Prime Minister Scott Morrison and NSW Premier's Gladys Birijiklian. Saudi Arabia has announced a series of measures to help prevent the spread of COVID-19 during the Islamic pilgrimage or Hajj later this month. It will limit the number of domestic attendees to around 1,000 and touching the Kaaba, Islam's most sacred monument, will be banned. Social distancing will also be imposed. In normal times, the pilgrimage is one of the most significant moments in the Muslim religious calendar. Some 2 million people are expected to travel to Mecca and Medina this July and August for the annual gathering, but only Saudi residents will be allowed to attend this year. India has recorded more than 24,000 new cases of COVID-19 in the past 24 hours, taking its total above that of Russia. The country now has the third largest number of confirmed cases in the world at 697,413. There have been 19,693 deaths. The largest surge in numbers have also been powered by a rise in cases from a handful of southern states including Tilangana, Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. India reopened shopping centers, places of worship and offices a month ago. For the last three days, India's caseload has galloped at an alarming rate, adding more than 20,000 daily infections per day. Although India has the third highest number of cases, it's eighth in fatalities. Malawi's new president, Lazarus Chakiwa, has called off independence celebrations and further scaled back plans on Monday's formal inauguration. Both events are due to be marked by a huge jamboree in Linogues football stadium. On Saturday, the president announced the stadium capacity will be halved into 20,000 to limit the spread of coronavirus. Now, the stadium festivities have been cancelled altogether, with the inauguration being moved to the military barracks to be witnessed by only 100 specially invited guests. The cancellation will put a dampener on the euphoria generated by the historic opposition triumph in a recent election rerun after last year's fraudulent polls were overturned. And that's all we have for you for news update right here on COVID-19 360. All right, and that was news updates. Now, quickly before we go into our case count. So yesterday, uh, TV3 reported that 92 out of 104 medical staff um, at one particular hospital, which is the Holy Family Hospital in Soto, had tested positive for COVID-19. Then we received a message, um, and she also wants to remain anonymous, but she says that I have something to share concerning the COVID-19 issue at the Holy Family Hospital. And um, she says that, so what's actually happening here is that when a staff tests positive, those who came on duty with that particular staff don't go into quarantine. They take your sample and you continue working until your result is released. You only self-isolate when you test positive. Wards were not closed down until recently when our staff strength began to reduce because most of us started testing positive. Last week, fumigation was done with patients lying outside, after which they were sent back to the wards, which wasn't the best. Then when things got out of hand, they decided to close down the whole hospital for a fumigation exercise, which was done a day. Uh, followed by cleaning exercise and then work commenced the following day. 12-hour shifts commenced when our staff strength reduced and things were getting out of hand. What we, are, uh, what we use during working hours is just the face mask without disposable gowns. And as I speak to you, I'm in isolation as well because uh, I have also tested positive. And so this is someone who works in that hospital. And it's sad to know that at a point when we're recording high numbers, amongst our medical staff there's a hospital where they only have access to face masks and nothing at all whilst treating COVID-19 patients something needs to be done about this unfortunately indeed something needs to be done and in the light of that 697 new cases have been recorded over the weekend taking our toll to 20,085 last week Friday we were somewhere over the, the 19,000 mark but as you can see on the Ghana Health Service dashboard, it says 20,085 confirmed cases with recoveries at 14,870 and deaths at 122. Active cases now at 5,093. And for the gender distribution, out of the 20,085 confirmed cases, the males are leading with 57% of that figure and females with 43%. And the greater Accra region, 
uh, they're still the highest in the epicenter when it comes to uh, confirmed cases with 10,979. The Ashanti region with 4,244. The Western region with 1,729. So these three regions are the ones over the 1,000 mark. Now, still on the Ghana Health Service uh, website, let's take a look at this table. And it gives us the number of cases per every uh, category of the different parameters. That is the general surveillance and enhanced contact tracing. And so in total, for the general surveillance, number of cases recorded in that parameter, we have 8,174. And for the enhanced contact tracing, we have 11,911. And so when you put these two figures in the various parameters together, it gives you a total case count, which is 20,085. And as at this morning, we have 22 severe cases, eight are in critical condition, and then active cases, of course, 5,093. Now, let's look at the number of tests that have been done so far, and we have 310,159. And for the routine surveillance, number of tests done so far stands at 113,195. And for contact tracing, we have 196,964. Generally, our positivity rate is at 6.48. Now, let's come down here to the summary of recoveries by region and also number of cases per region. And as of last week, uh, Friday or Thursday, this particular table was taken off. And I did mention that probably they were updating the figures. And this morning, it is back. So let's start off with the Hafu region, where 26 cases have been recorded so far and seven discharges or recoveries. And so for the discharges or recoveries, it becomes a little confusing because you don't know if the person has indeed recovered uh, or has been discharged for home management. But we will take it as it has been given to us as the Ahafu region has seven recoveries or discharges. The Ashanti region, the second highest in Ghana, with 4,244. And out of that figure, 2,504 have been discharged, giving us uh, a recovery rate of 39.5. And as at this 59.0, uh, I beg your pardon. Uh, as of this morning, active cases in the Ashanti region stands at 1,691. And so more active cases in the Ashanti region. And now let's go to the Buna region. 38 confirmed cases so far. 15 have recovered. And that is a recovery of 39.5. And active cases in that region, we have 23. The Buna East region with 136 confirmed cases, 51 recoveries. 37.5 recovery rate and then 85 active cases in the Buno East region. Now let's go to the central region where 983 confirmed cases have been documented so far with 768 recoveries, giving us a recovery rate of 78.1% and then active cases at 211. Eastern region 798 confirmed cases. 540 recoveries and so when we look at the recoveries in the region it gives us a recovery rate of 67.7 percent and active cases in the eastern region at 254. now the greater Accra region the highest so far with 10,979 very close to the 11,000 mark with recoveries at 8,422 and then Looking at the recovery rate in the greater Accra region, we have 76.7, even though we have more active cases still, which is 2,501. The northern region, 137 confirmed cases, 120 have been discharged so far, and active cases now at 13. The northeast region, eight confirmed cases, two recoveries, that is 25.0%, and then we still have five active cases in the northeast region. Let's go to the OT region where 112 confirmed cases have been put together so far. 98 out of the 112 have been discharged, and that gives us a recovery rate of 87.5% in the OT region, and active cases in that region, we have 14. The Savannah region has recorded 46 confirmed cases, 38 have been discharged and recovery rate is at 82.6%. And as of this morning, we have eight active cases in that region. Now let's go up north to the Upper East region where 278 cases have been confirmed. 275 out of the 278 have recovered and that is 98.9% recovery rate. So we have just one active case in that region. And now let's go to Upper West. We have 55 confirmed cases and then 54, giving us a recovery rate of 98.2%, one active case. And then 
It follows closely with the Volta region, 362 confirmed cases, 325 out of that figure have recovered, given as active cases are 36. And then finally, the Western North region with 154 confirmed cases, 82 have recovered. That gives us 72 active cases in the Western North region. And in the Western region, 1,729 active, uh, 1,729 confirmed cases. 1,569 have recovered and been discharged. That gives us a 90.7 recovery rate and active cases in the Western region, pretty low. That is 159. So out of the 1,729, we have active cases in the region at 159. So the Western region is doing quite well when it comes to recoveries, and that is some pretty good news. But that sums it up for our case count and management down here in Ghana. But I'll hand over to Bella at this point. Thank you. Yes, and um, an open letter has been written and signed by some 221 health workers. And we have one of the members joining us, Dr. Pius A. Sando. And so let me quickly just move him. Uh, into him and also we will be speaking to someone from the Ghana Medical Association as well uh, so they can tell us what they think about uh, EC going into phase two of the registration. Dr. Pius, good morning. Good morning, Bella. Thank you for joining us this morning. Now, what exactly does your letter seek to achieve? All right, Bella, thank you. Good morning to you once again and a very good morning to your cherished viewers. Um, you would recall um, a couple of weeks ago, exactly about two weeks ago, mm -hmm. um, an open letter was written to the electoral commissioner. Yeah. Um, that yeah. letter was signed by 113 uh, medical practitioners, mm -hmm. and I'm using that term to refer to a broad or heterogeneous group of uh, medical um, workers. Okay. Um, specifically, okay. we had a um, component of that being doctors. We had some nurses, some midwives. Mm. We had some lab staff, and we even had some record um, keepers and some cleaners signing on to that petition, which sought to um, which sought to um, implore the electoral commissioner to consider not conducting the voters' register. Mm -hmm. And this was based purely on a public health perspective that getting people to aggregate or gather for that exercise would spell doom for the country and possibly lead to an exacerbation in the number of cases of COVID-19 yeah. we have recorded. Um, we surmised at that point that the country had recorded about 14,500 cases and we had lost about 95 Ghanaians mm. to the disease. And we thought the picture was becoming bleak by the day and we thought conducting this exercise would further worsen the situation. Let me put it in perspective that as we speak today, the number as you shared on your platform now exceeds 20,000. That's those who have been infected by this disease. Mm -hmm. And we also have about 122 people who have passed on from okay. this disease. Yeah. Again, yeah. bringing it even into a better perspective, the disease now seems as expected not to be a respecter of persons and has somehow turned its eyes onto um, health practitioners. We have lost about four doctors. Um, I'll, I'll just say um, our condolences to their respective families and wouldn't want to um, remind them of the pain by mentioning their names. Yeah. We've lost a bed, we've lost some um, laps. Mm. Now, all these happened before this exercise. So two weeks ago, um, having foresight, knowing what usually happens when we have uh, mass registrations, um, knowing the tendency that some measures may be put in place, but would definitely be woefully inadequate to curtail the spread of this disease, we sounded a warning to the electoral commissioner. Mm -hmm. And this was purely based on a public health perspective yeah. and based on the evidence and the science. And the science simply tells us that when we aggregate, we are likely to see an increase in the numbers. Um, we sent this open letter to the electoral commissioner. You were all copied, and mm -hmm. I think... It became quite a topical issue, was discussed largely, but the end result we wanted was for a decision to be made not to take the reckless decision to conduct the um, electoral role, yeah. because that would eventually lead to a spike in the numbers. Be as it may, um, we are all witnesses to what happened last week. We saw the brazen disregard for all the protocols. We mm. saw people who had their uh, face masks down to the attend. We saw people who didn't even have face masks on. 
We saw people who didn't go by the simple hand washing protocols. And by hand washing, within a certain way, you would be there for about three to four hours. We would expect that even every hour, because you may touch something, you may touch your face or all that, mm -hmm. to wash your hands. We saw the disregard for that. And more worryingly, globally, the factor that has been shown to work yeah. is physical distancing. And I, for all the thousands of centers where this exercise is taking place, we had records that this wasn't being adhered to. Of mm -hmm. course, the Electoral Commission had a world area or perimeter where this was being observed. Yeah. But that could take about 10 people maximum, maybe at a time. Whilst about 100, 200, 300 people would be in the crowds and I'm um, talking and in close contact yeah. and um, virtually providing a background for the spread of it. Mm. So um, just a follow up to our open letter two weeks ago, yeah. which is a position we stand by and that's the position we wish this country had taken. Um, we are sounding the warning bells again that the evidence is there on the ground. Mm. If we go by this exercise and in its current from Bella, next two weeks when we talk, the picture will be very bad. Absolutely. So you're asking the EC to halt the process. They're already, you know, starting phase two or just about going into phase two of the compilation. Looking at the time restraint, what are you exactly saying? Should they stop it all completely or should they pause and try to figure out how they can control the situation? And if that's the case, what are some of the measures you want them to put in place? Bella, we actually have um, just about three options available to the EC. Mm -hmm. And I would say at this point, um, it may be to the EC and to the government in general. The first one would be for us to have a complete halt. Okay. And I think if I had my own um, opportunity to decide for the EC, or if the EC would look at the full picture, especially from last week and everything, that may be the option we would have to take. But of course, the options, I'll lay them bare and the ECU may choose the one that may serve the best purpose. Mm. The second one will be for us to have a temporary halt, uh, maybe two weeks, figure out what went wrong, look at the different centers. Are we going to have 300 seats maybe? Um, are we going to look at parks or whatever? And that directly lies in the ambit of the EC. And of course, it may contact like the GMA or other professional groups if we... Um, uh, just a collection of health workers, they think our views will be needed. Uh, yeah. It will give us a response. Of course, we are happy to provide that as citizens of Ghana. Mm. And then the third option will be for the EC to go on just as it is right now. And if it does go on the way it is, trust me, in three weeks, four weeks, two months, um, we'll see massive spikes in our numbers and the blame okay. will be squarely laid. At the doorstep of the EC and Let, let's say that they take your letter into consideration and decide that, okay, they'll take a, a, a moment to just figure out what to do differently so they can resume the compilation. And they ask you to give them a list of things that you think they haven't done right and so should include in their measures. If you have to list about three of them, what it, would it be? Because already, like you said, they already have uh, the washing of hands, uh, social distancing within the perimeter that's coded. And so... What else should they do? Okay. If the EC decides to go by that route, and of course it's going to be a very difficult one looking at 22 million people to register, um, one of the things that they have to do, for instance, wash hand, in, uh, wa wa wash, hand washing facilities, for instance, should be increased. Like we should have um, for each registration center quite a number, maybe 20, 30, to allow for people to frequently wash hands, which will mean there should be an um, excessive supply of um, mm. water. Two, um, soap, um, um, what do you call it, sanitizer, should be available in huge volumes so people can use. Mm. And I think the important point we want to make more than anything is about the um, physical distancing. Okay. And that's really yeah. very difficult to figure out. I don't All know right. how in most of the communities that will be done. If communities have, for instance, a park, for instance, would probably have to consider it should be um, like a period of, let's say, about three weeks to a month of the EC dedicating, having mass education and sensitization, mm. collaborating with communities, identifying um, huge centers, 
where this can be done. You have maybe about 300 seats to sit okay. people okay. with all that. You would understand some of these are uh, very, maybe very difficult to actualize. Okay. I see. That we will find ourselves in if they're easy to right. Okay. Dr. Pai Sanda, thank you so much for speaking to us. He's a member of the health professionals who penned that open letter to the EC to give them two options. One, to pause um, you know, the compilation of the voters register. Or two, they should allow posterity to judge them if any lives should be lost as a result of the compilation. Let's see what the EC is going to say. But now we're crossing over to the Ghana Medical Association. We have on phone the Vice President, Dr. Frank Srebo. And earlier I read a report about how some 150 medical doctors have tested positive for COVID-19 and four of them, unfortunately, have passed on. Good morning, Doc. Good morning, Bella. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, and I hope you're in good health. Oh, yes, I'm very fine. Thank you very much okay. for having me. It's heartbreaking I to hope you find are out. Good. Yes, I am. Thank you very much. It's heartbreaking to find Great. out how many doctors have tested positive for COVID-19, and even more devastating that four of them have passed on. Uh, these, of course, I'm sure are the latest figures, but does it cover the national um, you know, statistics, or do we have more health professionals testing positive? Uh, let me say good morning to your viewers. And um, yes, um, if indeed we have more health personnel who have tested it, um, to the virus. In fact, uh, the figures that we are giving is only for the doctors. And uh, I can tell you that even the figure that we gave, which was the 150, as of today, the number has increased. Hmm. And so um, it is not uh, something that I like can say we have ended the counting. Okay. So we, we are still counting. And um, after the time that we indicated that we have 150 doctors hmm. who have been infected, we even knew people who have been infected and have to wait yet actually, as far as the data was concerned. Okay. But and how many of those? More. Uh, huh? We are also getting a little bit more of the numbers also getting critically ill. How many so, more? Um, how many more hello? doctors? Hello? Dr. Sirwa, how many more doctors have tested positive? Um, as of today, I think we have had about more than 15 people in addition. So it means that we are already looking at 165. Wow. That uh, there's two have tested positive as okay. um, of today. Okay, but generally you don't have an overall figure of how many health professionals have tested positive across the country? No, we don't. Okay. We, we were quality figures for doctors, and uh, the nurses were doing the same. The last time we met the nurses, that was just last um, Wednesday, they indicated to us that they have over 300 of their members affected. Yeah. The health service workers in Union even had more, mm. almost 500. So if you put across board, we usually have about almost more than 1,000 um, across the, the, the device. And so wow. uh, the numbers are quite huge, they are. Uh, and it's quite scary. And, and what does it mean, looking at doctor per, uh, you know, patient ratio, what really does this mean? In actual fact, you can even look beyond the doctor patient ratio. Uh -huh. And uh, what it means is that we do have a lot of doctors who psychologically are not found mm. um, in the system now. In fact, um, it's quite difficult for even those who have not been infected because the workload is mounting. Yeah. The ones, um, your colleagues get infected, it means that you have to go off okay. and you have to take charge. Physician burnout is real. Mm -hmm. It's something that we are facing now. Um, people are now going on duty for a week without break, sometimes yeah. two weeks without break. Wow. And it is continuous. I, I and even for those who are there psychologically, they are not found because they are not sure when they will also be declared uh, as infected. And um, it is quite scary. It is not easy. We... Yeah actually mixing a lot, especially patients who are not even COVID-19 coming and um, because of the psychological stress and the things that are going on, they are not even getting the best yeah. uh, for themselves. Okay. We have had doctors who have come back as the COVID and when you interact with them and you look at their work output, you could see that um, it is reduced, it's gone down, they are not controlling themselves mm. and it's affecting um, service delivery. I can so imagine. Indeed, um, the, 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 the implications are huge, especially so in areas where they come back and so the issue of PPE is a challenge. Exactly, and, which um, is what I was coming people to. People are not getting PPEs and um, they have to dip their own hands into their pockets to buy their own uh, face masks 
them to buy some few uh, things that will help them to protect themselves. And so psychologically, it's a big, big challenge. And I believe that is one of the areas that we need to critically look at. Government so didn't say that... Let us make the PPs available. Yeah. Let us make sure that uh, at every level, anybody who needs to get some degree of protection gets that protection. Absolutely. So he's confident, he or she is confident when he or she is attending to a patient. Yeah, and yeah. it is different when you know that the system has done everything possible for you and yet you got infected. But when you know, deep down within your heart, that you didn't get the best of protection, mm -hmm. and so it gets infected, you got infected. It makes it very difficult to come back and be able to offer your best. Well, well, so government did say, Dr. Sribo, we have at the moment. okay, government did say that they were making available some millions of PPEs, and uh, I was wondering, did they not get to you at all? That is the problem that we are facing. We have international government officials since this um, pandemic um, broke out. Indeed, we are always assured that the PPEs are available. But the bottom line is that when you go to the facilities, they mm. are not there. In fact, this morning, we took um, a little bit of a trip to one facility in Kumasi. Mm. And when we asked about PPEs, it was clear, it was unanimous. They don't have them. And yet, we know the government has procured so much PCE. So we think that it appears that the distribution channels are not working. Yeah. Um, but, but if... They are using a fraud, and we need to look at it. Oh. But, but if that's the case, then you must be very concerned, because a lot of these doctors, even though they may have tested positive, are still going to work because of the reduced numbers. Does that worry you? In fact, this is worrying, and, and it's, it's, it's more worrying when even in some facilities, the doctors who are exposed are being denied testing mm. because they are told that they are not symptomatic. And so they have to wait till they are symptomatic before they are tested. And because they are not tested, they have to work. Wow. And so this is a doctor who obviously knows that he or she is exposed mm -hmm. and it's a risk to himself and to his patients. And somebody is asking him that, she continue working until he develops symptoms, and he's even refusing to be tested. And and that is even more worrying. And we have similar sentiments from Tamale Kitchen Hospital, to be precise. Wow. And, and it is quite worrying, and it is disturbing. Indeed, we are trying to investigate and find out exactly what is going on there. But doctors are calling us. Mm. They are telling us we have been exposed. We think that by now we should be in self-quarantine. Exactly. And somebody should be taking our sample. And yet, we are told that because we have not developed symptoms, we should come to work. Now, now, if, that, if that, that in itself is a big, big challenge, and the testing is taking too long for the results to come in. Now, if that's the case, I mean, once you're saying that you don't have PPEs and some of these doctors still have to go to work, how then do they protect themselves? What do they do? Uh, so most of the people have to dip their own hands into their pockets and buy it for themselves, and that is what people are doing. And so, I, in fact, uh, it is. It is. Uh, let me put it just on a lighter note. If somebody called me and we we're talking, and he was complaining, I said, "Oh, use some of the tax waiver." to buy uh, some PPE, mm. but in actual fact, that shouldn't be. The yeah. tax waiver that was granted uh, with health workers was not meant for them to use it in buying their PPEs. It was meant for some kind of motivation. But in this era now, what we are facing is that most people have to buy their own yeah. um, PPEs, buy their own gloves, buy their own uh, face shields, buy their own face masks, buy their own sanitizers, make sure that they have a that they have bought for themselves, and so forth. And, and, and it is very, very disturbing. Now, all these, challenges, all these challenges were included in that letter that you addressed to government and to the EC. And towards the end, you mentioned that uh, because the EC has decided to go ahead with the compilation of the voters' register, you would hold them accountable for the surge in case count and also for the death of anybody as a result. Do you still stand by that? We do. We still stand by that. So it is quite interesting to hear EC officials now running away from their responsibility and saying that individuals are supposed to be held accountable. We're in this country, when EC assured every single person in this country that they are able to carry out this exercise safely in the midst of this pandemic. In fact, officially, Ghana Medical Association never wrote and asked EC to stop. What we did was that we wrote to them and we indicated some points that we believe have to be followed. And at the end of the day, we told them clearly that they will be held accountable for any breaches in protocol that happen at the registration centers. So it is quite interesting that you have called for the dance, people have come, and now you are running away from your responsibility. Yeah. It is very, very disheartening. Indeed, the EC, before this registration, if they knew 
that people should be held accountable. They should have come out clearly to tell us that, look, for us, we are just organizing a registration. And that people who come there should take accountable uh, of anything that happened to them so that we are not responsible. In that case, we would have known exactly what to tell them. But okay. it's like they have already pushed us into the water. If they are running away from their responsibilities. We but, will not but, allow them to run away. We will still hold them accountable. We are saying that EC have called that people come there to register. And you hear some people trying to uh, put the exercise uh, analogous to people going to the market. Yeah. But, but, but the market is never anybody's civic responsibility. But Dr. Shribwa, the, the EC did say that they have put in place some measures to ensure that people are protected. I mean, they've corded one part where the activity is actually taking place. They're ensuring that anybody who walks in has a nose mask, they're washing their hands, their temperatures are being checked. They even have security on the ground to ensure that even those who are crowding would still adhere to social distancing protocols. So if they've done all these, they've given out chits to ensure that they don't have too many people at one spot. Is it not right that they say that anything else that happens outside of that is the responsibility of the individuals who come to the venue? We are asking them to do. We are not asking them to go beyond anything. We are not asking them to go into people's homes and ensure that they are social distancing. But once they come to the center, they should ensure that that is what happens. If people do, and that is the reason why the security forces are there to ensure mm. that they adhere to all the protocols. And so, EC should ensure that things don't happen. So why are they running away? And we are all away. There are a lot of centers. These things that they are, they are saying, it's not happening. Okay. It's not happening. You go there, people are masked up. And so, then for some people, even go there without face masks. In fact, some television stations have even picked people who have gone to the centers without face masks. And they are bold enough to say that they don't believe that COVID even exists. And yeah. if EC officials watch these people, the security agents watch them. So we, we think that if the person comes there and the person is not ready to go by all the protocols that you have put in place, that person is not ready to register. So that individual should be excused from the registration center or he or she is ready to follow the protocols. Mm. But if he cannot run away from these responsibilities, they have to be held accountable and they have to ensure that people who come there do the right things so that we can all be very safe. We, look, let me tell you, the mm. case count is mounting. Yeah. It is, it, is, it is quite interesting. We are doing um, fewer tests. We are getting more positives. Mm. Unlike previously, when we were doing more tests and getting fewer positives. Now we are doing fewer tests right. and we are getting more positives. Mm. We are no more doing this enhanced contact tracing, chasing people into the communities and so forth to test them. We are no more doing that. Basically, we are waiting for people to come to us and then we test them. And we are getting more positives. It's mm. scary. So if we are not careful and we allow EC to run away from there, I'm not saying that individuals should not okay. be held accountable. Individuals should not take their own security into their own hands. But once they come within your premises, within your circles, where you have decided that this is where you are doing a registration, you have to follow them. Okay. And I'm sure if somebody comes into your studio right now and decides that he or she is not going to follow the, the protocols, you will not allow the person to, to be there. Okay. Okay. Then the EC should see those areas that they are doing the registration as their own areas that they are manning and they are monitoring and making sure that the right things are done there. If the person leaves there and decides to go and do whatever he or she wants to go and do whatever, that is not your problem. All right. But within your jurisdiction, you have to do the right things. Dr. Shrebo, what is the GMA's next line of action? Looking at the situation at hand, the EC is still going ahead with the compilation of the voters' register. Um, you know, we're also getting more doctors getting infected, more health professionals as well. What is your next line of action? Our uh, next line of action is very simple. We have scheduled some meetings with the government um, team on COVID. We, we are hoping to meet them. We will have to will raise these issues. We will see how government is responding. Mm. And then we will continue to offer them uh, the letter that we have. And we will offer our support. We will definitely continue monitoring the processes at mm. the centers and we'll call the EC out even if we will not we of course we don't have the power to go and stop the registration but we'll call them out okay but we believe that the right things can be done and now we believe that EC is capable of doing it i'm sure they do a simulation exercise they are able to make sure that the right things are done why can't they replicate it? Mm. so we think okay. that they should be able to they should one up All right. and hold and throw their, their their heads up and say that yes we are responsible will take these actions and will abide by these actions. They should not run away like they are, some of them are trying to do. Okay, they all right. All right. This is the attorney, and they should ensure that at least their names are safe. All right.
Thank you so much, Dr. Frank Strebo. He's a vice president of the Ghana Medical Association. They put out a statement indicating that 150 doctors had been infected with four, unfortunately, passing on. Well, at this point, he says that 50 more of them have also been infected. And so that's increased the number of doctors that have been infected. Anita is going to read, uh, well, sorry, she's going to give us the uh, case count for Africa. And so, Anita. All right, so when we move uh, from Ghana to the continent of Africa, we have 478,545 confirmed cases with 6,967 healthcare workers who have been affected. Deaths progressing steadily at 11,393 with recoveries at 228,914. And South Africa is still the highest on the continent and very close to the 200,000 mark. And as of this morning, the number of confirmed cases in South Africa stands at 196,750. And just on Saturday, 10,853 cases were confirmed in South Africa. And authorities in South Africa uh, are saying that there's, there's a spike in the largest city in South Africa, which is Johannesburg. And they're thinking of reimposing some restrictions on that particular province in order to curb the uh, spread of the virus. And over the past couple of weeks as well, one of the provinces in South Africa which recorded a lot of cases and was contributing over 60% to the total confirmed cases in South Africa was the Western Cape. But uh, it looks like that uh, particular province is reducing when it comes to the number of figures that have been recorded daily. Now let's go to Egypt, which is the second highest with 75,253. And Egypt authorities in charge of health are saying that they are recording less cases, even though they are the second highest on the African continent. And as from June 19th, the lowest that has been recorded so far is 1,218 cases in Egypt. That was over the weekend. And so that is even uh, the lowest, that is even above the thousands, is still their lowest, meaning that Egypt over the past couple of weeks has been recording over the 10,000. Now let's go to Nigeria where they've had six state governors being affected by the COVID-19 virus. Down here in Ghana, we've had similar situations of some top officials uh, being affected. And in Nigeria, they have six some uh, state governors, including the Oyo state governor and also the Ogun state governor as well. But some of them have recovered, which is some good news. But in everything that is happening in Nigeria, they have 28,711 confirmed cases. Down here in Ghana... We have 20,085 confirmed cases and that milestone was crossed over the weekend. And so Ghana now joins countries that have recorded over 20,000 cases. Algeria, 15,941. And like I mentioned last week, Algeria, uh, the president of Algeria is saying that until the country is COVID free, they are not easing restrictions and they are not opening their borders until they can say that Algeria doesn't have any case. Now let's move on to the recoveries and South Africa when it comes to this parameter is leading very close to the 100,000 mark. And by the end of the week, definitely they would have crossed that 100,000 mark when it comes to recoveries in South Africa. And so this morning, we're looking at 93,315 recoveries in South Africa and then Egypt, 20,000. 726 recoveries, Ghana coming in third with 14,870, and then Nigeria with 11,665. Quickly, let's glance through the deaths and see which countries are recording the highest um, in that parameter as well. And for this particular one, Egypt is leading with 3,343, South Africa with 3,199, and then Algeria with 952, followed closely in the fourth position with Nigeria with 645. Now let's cross over to the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center dashboard where 11,465,636 ,000, cases have been confirmed globally with 6,189,108 recoveries uh, recorded globally as well. And then later on we're moving into the deaths. And uh, our usual suspect, which is the United States, with 2,888,730 confirmed cases. And over the weekend, uh, the state of Florida in the United States uh, has recorded over 200,000 cases uh, in that particular state. So out of the 2 million or 2.8 million cases in the United States, um, 
Florida is contributing over 200 cases in that particular state, uh, including Texas and some other ones are also contributing high numbers to the total number of cases recorded in the states. Now let's go to Brazil where 1,603,055 cases have been confirmed so far. And as always, the president of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, is in the news. And he has sanctioned uh, the mandatory wearing of masks in public places. But he says that if you're visiting a shop or you know going to any other public place, you can wear the mask. But uh, being able to wear it every single place, then it shouldn't be done. And so he is going against it and he's gone against most of the sanctions or the protocols that have been put in place and so now let's go to india and over the past couple of weeks india was uh below um, russia but over the weekend india has uh you know wrapped up the figures and now is the third highest on the global scale but we're taking a break at this point when we come back I'll be giving you more on which countries are in the fifth and sixth position. And interestingly, we have two special countries now occupying that spot. It's still COVID-19, 360. We'll be back with more. Do stay. Welcome back. Still COVID-19, 360. We'll be crossing over to Dr. Bertha shortly, but let's still continue with our case count. All right, sure. So over the past couple of weeks, we've seen Russia maintain the third highest on the Johns Hopkins uh, dashboard. But over the weekend, India with over 23,000 cases now taking the third spot and Russia now replacing that uh, in the fourth position with 686,777. And like I mentioned before, we went on the break to... Uh, new countries which have you know, over the past couple of weeks we've seen them below the united kingdom now have overtaken the united kingdom given united kingdom the seventh spot and now in the fifth position we have peru with 302,718 and peru on sunday jumped past that 300,000 mark after it recorded some over 10,589 cases and this particular country has over 30 million uh, you know citizens in that particular country and now coming in sixth we have Chile and Chile uh, hasn't been in you know anywhere close to the highest so far it was always below the United Kingdom and like I keep mentioning now Chile on Sunday also made its debut in terms of the highest with 295,532 confirmed cases. So I'm sure in the uh, next couple of weeks, uh, we've seen more of these countries. And if there isn't a better management of cases in these countries, they will be going past the likes of Russia, India and Brazil. But with over 1 million cases in Brazil, I don't know how uh, they will be able to do that. But now let's cross over to the recoveries where globally we're doing really well with 6,189,108 recoveries. And Brazil, that huge jump, over 1 million recoveries in Brazil this morning. That is 1,029,045 recoveries. Uh, given the United States the second position with 906,763, and then Russia with 453,495 recoveries. And then India with 424,433. And then Chile now comes in here again with 261,039. Let's uh, take a quick glance at the debts globally as well and see what is happening. And so for the debts, the United States is leading. So out of the 534,000, 588 deaths. The United States has 129,947 confirmed deaths so far. And Brazil with 64,867. Third, the United Kingdom with 44,305. And so for more details on which countries are doing uh, you know, well when it comes to recoveries and also are racking in the figures on the global scale, just visit the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center dashboard. And still the projection is at 15 million with 188 countries or regions recording cases so far. And so uh, expert Dr. Betha Sewa is standing by and as yes. always, Bella, we have a conversation with her. Bella, oh, yes. So let me cross over to her. Good morning, Doc. Happy New Week. Doc, can you hear me? We can't seem to hear you. Thank you very well. Yes, can okay. you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Good morning and happy new week to you. Happy new week and happy new week to your audience as well. All right. 
Now, last week we recently touched on the issue of vaccinations. And so today I think we should just broaden the scope a little. First of all, let's talk about the different types of vaccines and the stages that we have reached in terms of coming up with these vaccines. Um, thank you, Bella, for that question. So for the um, coronavirus vaccine, you know that by this time, the virus has an envelope and has spike proteins on it. Um, it is these spike proteins that the virus uses to attach to the respiratory uh, mucosa. And so vaccines are being developed, one, either to mimic the spike proteins or to introduce genes into the body that will direct the body to produce those spike proteins. And so there are what they call adenovirus and um, prototypes where they've taken chimpanzee adenoviruses and put the genes that encode for these spike proteins into the adenoviruses so that once it gets into us, the body would recognize, it will produce the spike proteins and the body would recognize it and form antibodies. And that okay. is the Oxford vaccine that is being tested in South Africa right now. Um, the Chinese are also working on these similar adenovirus vaccines and other companies like the one in the US, they are working on an RNA vaccine, meaning they are going to introduce the gene into the body for it to try and produce the spike protein and other companies are working on what they call DNA vaccines. So those are the different kinds out there. Okay. So far as progress is concerned, there are over 200 vaccine candidates. Only about 13 of them are in clinical trials, meaning they are in various stages being tested. Mm. And it's the Oxford vaccine that is the most advanced. It's in stage three, meaning that they are... Um, enrolling large amounts of people. They're targeting about 20,000 in the United Kingdom, um, 6,000 in Brazil, and another 2,000 in South Africa. Oh, I see. Okay, so how long do we have to wait? Because you mentioned the trial has begun. So I'm not sure how many countries uh, these trials are taking place. But if that's the case, if you can tell us the countries and also how close are we to actually confirming that a vaccine works for COVID-19? Right. So um, for a vaccine to show that it works, so let's take United Kingdom, for example. They are looking to give people a placebo, meaning something that is not a COVID-19 vaccine. Yeah. And they're actually using the meningitis vaccine in, um, in UK as the placebo. Mm. Um, probably take about half, 10,000 people, give them the placebo, another 10,000, give them the actual vaccine, and okay. then see what actually happens. Does it protect those who got the vaccine? For example, if they find the rate is two out of 100 people in those who were given the vaccine, and um, those who were not given the actual vaccine, maybe 60 out of 100, then clearly the vaccine is protective. So currently, they're doing it in the United Kingdom where they started, and they're also doing it in Brazil and South Africa. And why these countries? These, this particular vaccine is being done in these areas because... Um, Bella, if you have a vaccine and you've eradicated the disease or your case count is low, you won't be able to test it, which is a problem China is having now because they've managed to bring the disease um, transmission to such a low figure. They're having difficulties proceeding with their phase three trials. It mm. means now you control the disease. So even if you vaccinate people, how would you tell? Um, I don't want to say they are looking to Africa for this, but I'm sure they would want to partner with some African countries who are still having transmission yeah. to see if um, they will be able, or maybe even South, I mean, um, South America. Because as you can tell, um, Africa is getting to that quick exponential phase where cases are starting to gallop in most countries. But that yeah. is just the UK vaccine. Other people are doing vaccine trials in Europe. Um, and also, of course, the Chinese are trying to see if they can find people to vaccinate now that their disease transmission is very much lower. Okay. In the UK, I, I do understand the experiment is still ongoing, but have they been able to ascertain how effective uh, it is against the placebo? Um, yes. I mean, that's why they do the phase one and phase two trials okay. to show that it's effective. It's been able to elicit an antibody response. But that's why they do these large studies. They have to find out how many people would it actually protect. Not every vaccine is effective. In fact, the FDA in the United States has said 
they would only approve a vaccine if it shows that more than it will protect more than 50 percent of people and in fact in spite of all these 200 most experts believe only about two or three would get to a stage where it will be acceptable to be used on a mass scale because several of them may not work i see but in africa i remember when this whole conversation about vaccine trials started uh you know there were all kinds of theories with people admonishing africans to resist the trials i remember you said sometime that we should also uh, as much as possible take part in the trials so that uh, you know, we can also take claim or, or whatever for whatever happens afterwards. Do you still stand by that? Should we allow them to try these vaccines on us? Well, yeah, I think that ethically, it's not just that we're trying. So let me tell you what's happening. Four countries in Europe, namely Italy, France, Germany, and Netherlands, they have already, even before this Oxford vaccine has been proven to be fully efficacious, They've already purchased 400 million doses mm. as a backup. Okay. And the United States has already invested $1.2 billion to tell this company, AstraZeneca, that this is how much we want to buy. In addition, there's given over $600,000 to this company called Moderna to start manufacturing as soon as their vaccine shows efficacy and that vaccine is not even in that stage three trial it's only in july that it will go in now what this tells me is that it's not about race or anybody's plan to decimate the black population or come and give us any bad vaccines the european countries and caucasians are getting ready to buy them because they believe it's protective mm. so if we go with theories of oh maybe the vaccine is out to hurt us i think we will do ourselves a disfavor because you need to partake in the vaccine to show that it's actually going to work in africa what if we find that it doesn't work mm. then we don't even have to buy large doses but then if you partake in the trials and you also get involved or stay with the progress your country would have the vaccine available it will be accessible it will be cheaper. So I mean, those are some of the few reasons why we, we need to have an open mind and realize just like industrial revolution and so many things that have happened, information age, a lot of things happen and we're left behind. This time, we need to try and stay in tandem with the progress that is going on. Now, in the case of Madagascar, they came out with what they thought was a cure. Now we're hearing that their numbers have surged and so they're going to have to go back into lockdown and all that. But just the way the world handled the situation concerning Madagascar and that cure, don't you think that that's also going to deter uh, some African countries from trying to come up with a vaccine just because they are not sure how the world will respond to it? All right, so Bella, let me handle that in two ways. First of all, Madagascar and then Africa trying to take part. Um, Africa's, um, Madagascar's medication was handled the way it was because unlike all the other medications that were on the market they had all been tried and tested chloroquine hiv drugs um dexamethasone you name it everybody knew their side effects i mean even chloroquine look at the in spite of the fact that we've used this for decades to treat malaria look at the scrutiny it went through they presented a tea um without all the data and they wanted everybody to swallow it but um Despite how it was handled, you would ask yourself, if the tea is that curative, why did they have a spike in cases? Why isn't everybody drinking the tea in Madagascar to um, eradicate the disease? But um, coming back to Africa, actually no one country in Africa is ready to manufacture vaccines at this time. We just don't have the money or the production capabilities. Hmm. Um, we, we consume 25% of the world's vaccines, but we don't make any. So this is actually an opportunity for African countries to come together to brainstorm and see, okay, what are our capabilities? Where can we start doing something? Or like Italy, Europe, and um, Italy and America have done, should we at least start doing some type of purchasing agreement? Should we also register to say, okay, we would need 500,000 vaccines, even mm -hmm. at a minimum. We need to start making those steps, at least to secure it, so that 
in January or February when it's ready, we won't find that we're not able. But at the same time, it gives opportunity for our scientists to start thinking three years from now, two years, or even right now in the next six months, uh, Africa CDC is looking to start what they call a vaccine trial network okay. so that some hospitals and institutions would at least come together to see how Africans can participate in these clinical trials. Hmm. That's interesting. Well, let, let's keep our fingers crossed and see uh, what happens. But I say what, by January or February, that's when we'll know if we have a vaccine or not. Yes. Okay. We'll wait patiently um, for that. But thank you so much, Dr. Betha, for speaking to us this yeah. morning. It's always a pleasure. Okay. All right. Dr. Betha Sewa Ai is an infectious disease specialist. Shortly, we'll be crossing over to the Accra Girls Senior High School with our correspondent, Armstrong, so he can give us on the ground updates of what's happening after six of their students tested positive uh, for COVID-19. And so this is COVID-19 360. We'll be back. Welcome back. It's still COVID-19 360. We have a couple of minutes to go, but your messages have been coming in and I'll be taking a couple of them. This one says, good morning. The rate at which the coronavirus cases keep increasing, the EC should ensure the necessary protocols. Most of the centers aren't practicing social distance, and that is coming from Diary of a Ghanaian in Adabraka. Hello, Stanning Anita. We're actually in a state of quandary and it's indeed touching and shattering that the numbers are still escalating. It's high time we thought of a possible way out as Ghanaians because COVID is never a respecter of persons. Nevertheless, we are not alone. God is with us. And that is coming from Wedam Kagua. Okay. The next one says, this is how Brazil started. The president downplayed the virus and Brazil now records a staggering 34,000 plus cases daily with currently over uh, 57,000 deaths. South Africa has started converting fields to hospitals and cases rising sharply. Remember, Ghana isn't far from South Africa. Hmm. Hello, Bella and Anita, the frontliners. As usual, you both are stunning. Keep up the hard work and continue to stay safe. That is coming from Joshua in Kumasi. Hello, Bella and Anita. Please, I need your help. My dad got exposed to an infected person and his sample was taken last around May. He self-isolated for two weeks and went back to his normal activity because the results were not ready. Yesterday, he had a call telling him his test, which uh, was positive, and so he should take azithromycin and vitamin C if he's showing symptoms. But my problem is just three weeks ago, he was unwell. That is, he had fever, loss of taste and weakness. And he went to the hospital and was given antibiotics. And so that is a very critical issue and definitely will be getting uh, more, you know, analysis on it. But uh, right about now, Bella is standing by with Armstrong, our uh, reporter on the ground. And uh, yeah. we're having a conversation with him on what is happening at some of the centers. Bella. All right. So he's actually at um, the Accra Girls Senior High School, I believe. And we heard that six of the students had tested positive. And so parents are withdrawing their children from the school uh, out of fear and panic. And so we want to find out from him what really is the situation currently. Armstrong. Hello, Bella. Hi. How are you? T um, tell us what's happening now. Hello. Here at the Akai Girls Senior High School, uh, some parents have come far and near to uh, get their work back home following some uh, issues or allegations that some of the students here have uh, been confirmed positive. And uh, at least parents not numbering less than 100 are saying that uh, until the awards are given to them, they are not going to leave this place. Hmm. And here currently, the media, we are being prevented from getting access onto the school compound, just like the parents. Uh, we are here, we've been here, trying to get school authorities to get some confirmations from about all the allegations that uh, we are hearing. But uh, the school authorities are yet to come out to give us any information. But then let me say on record that I have some uh, teacher friends here who are, who are teachers here. Mm. I managed to get them outside the compound and from uh, some distance, I spoke with them that they should just tell me what exactly the issue is because there's no need for us creating fear and panic out there. Mm -hmm. if the issue we are hearing that some students here have con uh, contracted a virus, it's not true. They should just open up and tell us the truth. And let me say that the teachers confirmed to me that, yes, indeed, yesterday some students were rushed to the hospital after mm. uh, they fell ill. And the issue is that they have confirmed that 
they have COVID-19. Uh, but they, they were telling me these are only two students uh, compared to what is being uh, said out there. That okay. It, but these teachers are telling me it's two students they saw being rushed to the hospital and also one teacher. That's hmm. what uh, the teachers I spoke to told me here, Bella. So it doesn't mean that they did not necessarily speak to the fact that some 11 students were isolated, tested, and that's how they got the six that tested positive? I, 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 I can't hear you, Bella. Armstrong, can you hear me? I, I can hear you. Okay, the reports did say that there were some 11 students uh, that were isolated, and out of that, six of them tested positive. Does it mean that's not true, based on what the teachers are saying? Okay, so the teachers I spoke to, they, they, they told me they saw two people being rushed with an, in, in an ambulance okay. to the hospital. Okay. You understand? They, they, they told me they saw two students being rushed in an ambulance. That's what they said they saw. Okay. But they can't confirm that they are six. But what they saw with their eyes uh, is they said they saw two students. Two mm. students. The mm. first one they, they was picked alone, and the second they came to pick another lady to their place. Okay. And I also spoke to one. Uh, I also spoke to one uh, parent here who told me he was invited by the school authorities to come and then uh, get uh, his child from this place. He came out there from Kumase, mm. and when he got here, he was told that a child is coughing and that he, he needs to get her some drugs. But when he got here, he said they, they, they told him he can't get access to his child who has fallen ill. So that is what is happening here. I'm trying to get the parent, the parents to, yeah. to us on air and find out what Okay, but uh, I mean, whilst uh, you look for this parent, there he, seems to be some agitation. Is, what is causing that? Pardon? I'm saying before you even locate that parent, there looks to be some form of agitation. What's really causing that? You know, the uh, one police officer came here. I don't know. I'm not sure of his rank. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. But uh, I, I saw his name tag. That is Edu Enim. Uh -huh. He came, spoke with the parents, and told them that he's going to use uh, minimum force on, on them if they do not uh, ensure social distancing. Wait, he said uh, he's going to use what on them? Go. Sorry, I'm strong. He's I going think... to use some minimum force. So right now he has scored for. Yeah, yeah. so that is what is happening here. You know, so. Oh, oh. Okay. Yeah, so... Is that him? That is what is happening here. So uh, they called the assembly to come and lock up all the cars that have been parked here. And uh, but earlier, as I was saying, I was saying that the police officer, so the senior police officer, so uh, a name, Ado, I saw he threatened to use minimum force on the parents if they do not observe social distancing here. Okay. And the parents, of course, will not spare him. They uh, hooted at all the police officers here, and then by the time I realized, they moved. From this place. So currently, the assembly is also here trying to ensure that they ask the parents to uh, observe social distancing. Unfortunately, uh, the parents will not yield to that. I so, um, okay. fortunately, I've seen the man who uh, came all the way from Kumase uh -huh. to pick uh, his child that uh, he's here to see his child. Okay. Now, that he had to say. Okay. Now, okay. Uh, you can say, uh, yeah, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going to uh, we are patient, mm. but for the past in a murder, she mm. none of them says she will some attack in a uh, or And I just said, uh, you know, you know, my other day. Postmaster, and a mapa. You never do us a bit of an insight, you see, first part. So, you never do us any mouse, I said, demonstration is so fortunate. Never see me, Jana, we move that time there. I'm trying to get the microphone closer to him. We can't really hear you. I don't know the mind. I mean, we already do a year or year, I say, from commanders or nurses. No, 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 so, uh, Ella, that is the parent uh, talking to us about uh, the child not feeling well and also he also not being able to uh, see.
the child as we took you. Let me talk to you. Okay. This. I'm sure we unfortunately don't have too much time. Okay, uh, well, Armstrong will be coming your way with a full-blown report later. And so uh, keep your gaze on TV3 and we'll update you on what's happened. This is actually very sad, seeing how stranded parents are uh, at this particular school where it's been reported that some six students, now we're hearing two students as per the conversation that Armstrong had with one of the teachers, uh, we're hearing that they have tested positive and it's likely that a teacher may have tested positive as well as he's been rushed to the hospital and so well let's read some of your messages before we wrap up and this one says i think the ec has to pause the registration process because some places are crowded in such a way that they do not observe the COVID 19 protocols we're pleading with the ec and government to stop the process for now if not our life is at risk a good morning bella and team I have a nose block or something I don't even know, but I can't smell anything and I've lost appetite and I don't even feel the taste of the food I eat. And uh, I, re I read loss of appetite is part of the symptoms. So I just want to know if I'm developing symptoms or it's just a common cold because I'm not the only one suffering from this. Mm. A very good morning to you, Anita and Bella. I'm John Neil and Tevandapoy. I think the ongoing voter registration exercise can be linked to the recent galloping of our case count. Ever since the registration began, we've recorded incessant increment, and this is worrisome. I have registered, and I can attest to the fact that observation of the protocols is a tough nut to crack. I absolutely agree with the GMA's call for the halting of the exercise. We have nothing to lose anyway. Okay, finally, this one is coming from uh, Joe in Accra, New Town, and about the Accra Girls SHS. What are teachers and authorities doing about it? He's asking, and I know you are at home, uh, asking as well as thing, uh, things are getting out of hand in that particular school. But tomorrow, right here on COVID-19 360, we'll be giving you more updates on that. And also in a subsequent broadcast as well, we'll be giving you updates on whatever is happening. But that's it for this morning on COVID-19 360. My name is Anita Ikea Kupa. I've been doing this with uh, Berlin Mundi. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be back tomorrow at 10 a.m. Until then, keep watching TV. Too.